Please be seated. What a pleasure it is to be here with you today and to get to see this marvelous building that goes on for forever. I've already learned that. And to discover that there's a special celebration today related to the luncheon and uh, the, the famous poet. So I'm just really thrilled to be here and to uh, have time with your children and with you. Her name was Debbie. She was an older girl in the neighborhood I grew up in who had decided to befriend little old me and whom I felt privileged to be noticed by. She was tall for her age, red-headed and talkative, and well, for a time, she was my idol. What this meant, of course, is that what Debbie did, I, without hesitation, wanted to do. Where Debbie went, I, without hesitation, wanted to go. What Debbie wore, I, without hesitation, wanted to wear. What Debbie said, I, without hesitation, wanted to say. In other words, who Debbie was, I, without hesitation, wanted to be. At first, my parents were amused by my idolization and imitation of my new older friend. They were, in fact, amazed that their independent, rambunctious daughter had found anyone whom she would allow to influence her. All this continued until Debbie began to be interested in wearing makeup. Suddenly, my parents began questioning my imitation of her and started saying things like this, maybe things that you heard from your parents or things you've said to your kids. Would you jump into a fire if your friend did such a thing? Because a lot was at stake here in this makeup thing. Would you step off the top of a tall building just because your friend did it? And of course, they were right to raise these questions, weren't they? For following others in an uncritical, unquestioning, and unhesitating way can lead to problems, and in some cases, serious problems. And in a sense, we're never too young to learn this, particularly in today's world, where we look across the globe and we see what looks like people following others into serious trouble for them and for us in an unhesitating, unquestioning way. Religion gets associated with that most fully, doesn't it? Not just politics, but religion. Which is why you and I may feel more than a little uncomfortable as we hear our gospel reading for today. In that reading, we hear about four grown men with lives and businesses, family businesses, and family relationships. We hear about them leaving behind everything and everyone to follow this young man named Jesus. And according to Mark, they do this, they follow him without asking any questions and without the least bit of hesitation. In fact, it's right in the middle of things that they follow him. Our gospel reading for this morning comes very early in Mark's gospel, which means that we've only heard a few things about Jesus by the time we get to today's story. We know that Jesus has been baptized by John the Baptist, and that right after that, he spent 40 days in the wilderness undergoing temptations as a way to prepare him ostensibly for his public ministry. We'll hear that very reading at the first Sunday of Lent this year. But despite this sparse background, we do know one important thing about Mark's Jesus already in this gospel. He moves with an urgency, a purpose, and an authority that says he's about doing something very important. In fact, the word immediately is strewn throughout Mark's gospel, and it's kind of Mark's trademark word when speaking about Jesus. As our reading for this morning begins, we hear what all that urgency is about. Jesus has come to proclaim the inbreaking of the kingdom of God, a realm that asserts the dignity of every human being and calls everyone to live out of that dignity in the face of anything that would seek to undermine it. Now, we may think that that's just, oh, of course, well, you know, the world should be a place where people have dignity and they act out of it. But remember, he's speaking it into a society not 
completely unlike ours, in which this was not the value shared by everyone, far from it, as a matter of fact. It was another kingdom. It was the kingdom of Rome that had some assumptions about the worth of people of all kinds. It's then that our call story occurs after this little preface. And in that, that you heard Liz proclaim, is Jesus is going along the Sea of Galilee and spots two fishermen, Simon and Andrew, who are in the middle of casting their nets. Jesus tells them to follow him and he will make them fishers of people. And they follow without any questions, without any hesitation. And then the same thing happens again, just to make the point. Jesus sees James and John, and with their father Zebedee, that's an important detail, in their boat mending their nets, he calls them, and immediately they leave not only those nets, but their father, and follow Jesus without any questions, without any hesitation. Which, of course, takes us back to the issue I identified before. What do we make of this following without asking any questions and without any hesitation? Is it just a bit of biblical hyperbole? Or is it getting at something else, something that has implications for our own callings, that is, our decisions about what or who to follow in our spiritual lives, our work lives, our lives with our family and friends, and the ways we participate in life in the civic realm? And then because this parish is celebrating its patronal feast today. I'm so honored to be a part of it. We have to ask what this call story, with its unhesitating response, has to do with this parish community of St. Agnes, a parish named for a saint who was not exactly a moderate, <laughs> a saint who, when very young, was martyred for following Jesus. Does God ask either of us or of this parish, that it have an unhesitating, an unquestioning response when the call comes to follow. Is that what this is about? So where I want to go with this is two different directions. It is sort of encapsulated by this phrase, no, dot, 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 but. No, dot, 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 but. And so first, let's go to the no. Because it's important, I think, for us to go to the no first. These, in my estimation, these call stories do not mean that you or I or our children or this parish should respond to the call of God to follow Jesus or anyone else, for that matter, without questions or without time, without hesitation. In fact, quite the opposite is true in our tradition. For us as Anglicans, the process of discernment, the process by which God in community unveils to us the specifics of our several callings, is all about articulating our questions and giving them the time they need as we discern what God and with, with, the, with God and with each other what the next step in our unfolding vocation might be. So this is true for individuals, and it's true for communities. And so no, you and I are not called to immediate and unquestioning action in our lives. Some of us have moments where that is so, where we met the person we wanted to spend the rest of our life with, and oh my gosh, the voice inside said, this is the one, oh dear. Or something clicked, but typically there's a lot that gets us there. Instead, I think, we're called to hold out our questions to that loving and dignifying mystery we call God and to the other people in our lives and trust that God will hold us as we discern our way forward. So a story about this other thing, and I'm really trying to tell it in many churches in this diocese. Paul Tillich, a noted theologian who taught at Union Seminary in New York City, was once challenged by a biblically conservative student in a lecture hall. So Paul Till was kind of a giant in theology. He was, he was trying to take the whole realm of theology and make it deal with, explore it in a way that made it relevant to today's lives. But some questioned the, his 
his reading of, of biblical literature. So the student rose, Bible in hand, and asked him publicly, said, Dr. Tilly, do you believe that the Bible is the infallible word of God? That is my reading. Do you have the kind of faith that is unhesitating and unquestioning when it comes to the Bible? That is, it says something, you just do it. Tillich gave this answer. He says, if we grasp it, no. If it grasps us, yes. Do you see the difference? If we grasp it, no. If it grasps us, yes. That's what I'm talking about, about discernment. In other words, being unhesitating and unquestioning is not of much value if it comes out of a belief that we have figured it all out, that it's as simple as Simon says. But when we take the time to be grasped by something larger in prayer, in community, in study, well, that is a different story with an unpredictable path ahead of it. Because once God grasps, all bets are off in my experience. Which leads me back to the second part of what I want to say about Mark's depiction of the call of Simon and Andrew and James and John and you and me. Their immediate and unquestioning response to Jesus' call to follow is less about us and more about God's own urgency. And we hear about that urgency in both those other readings. That beautiful reading that Grace did was all about ur God's urgency. God's urgency. In other words, it's less about the process or not we should follow as we try to listen to God's call to us. And it's more about God's own urgency to proclaim that a realm of dignifying love has come near us. And to use Tillich's words, is trying to grasp us. And what is more, what this passage is about is the fact that God needs other human beings. So Jesus was baptized, uh, was in the wilderness, and then the first thing he did was to go find people to do this with him, to get behind him, which is really what the verb being used in this passage. Will you get behind me? God needs people like you and me who like Simon and Andrew and James and John already have lives and obligations and families. They're not sitting around idle. God actually needs us to bring this news to a world that even now is still waiting to hear it. Waiting to hear it in terms of racial equality. Waiting to hear it in, in, around economic justice. Waiting to hear it just in terms of whose voices we listen to. And so this morning, where in your own life is a greater loving and dignifying mystery trying to grasp you, trying to hold you in his or her hand? And also, where in the midst of obligations and relationships and work that you already are up to, are you being called to let go of some things in order to respond to that loving and dignifying mystery that has an urgency all its own. And because this is the patronal feast of this parish, where are you as a parish noticing the grasp of the loving and dignifying mystery we call God that emerges over time as you notice how things are going? Where in the midst of the things you are already doing are you feeling a little tug, a little urge to let some things go and to take up other things as a response to a God who needs us to be the realm of dignifying love for others? And not 50 years ago, but here and now. Right here in this neighborhood, right here in this time, right here with these people. Jesus says, follow me. And four fishermen, Simon and Andrew and James and John leave everything and follow without hesitation and without questions. Our following is of a different but related kind. A following that is not like a childhood imitation or of an idol or Simon says that immediately kind of lets go of everything in order to follow. Instead, it is 
It is a product of the grasp of the dignifying love of God, and it yields our joining God in the expression of a new and transforming realm of dignifying love that has already and urgently come near.